So I literally just finished The Time Machine by H.G. Wells, like 10 minutes ago. Uh, and it, it came out in 1895, a time in which there was a lot of social appeal and people were very... It was like in the forefront of the... Uh, a lot of vaccines being made and a lot of, of science um, be coming into the forefront of human lives and many people were kind of critical of around the time you know, think, you're thinking of like people being critical of the factory system and, um, and um, workers and the relationship between worker uh, capital uh, worker and um, uh, and owner and not owner but owner of uh, work the workers are of capital and the owners are capital um, there's a lot of tension there and we get in the there's a couple of decades before we have Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels writing the communist manifesto and then a couple of around the same time, for maybe a couple of years before that, there was Charles Darwin on the origin of species, and you had these two kind of thread, threads of Darwinism and uh, Marxism that seem to be trying to engage with one another, or at least H.G. Wells seems to be engaging with these two authors, with these two ways of thinking in the novel, where, in a way that I never really expected to deal with, you know, um, I, I'm not very familiar with science fiction, I don't really read a lot of science fiction, and I haven't actually read a lot of fiction lately, as a, uh, apart from the Ficciones, um, Borges' um, book of short stories, I haven't read um, a novel or novella in a while, so this was a welcome change of pace for me. Uh, the Time Machine, it was a classic, and I saw it laying around the house, I don't remember why I had it, uh, why I bought it, but I had it, so I just read it, I knew it was a short read, just to take a, a bit of a break after um, the thing I read last, whatever, what was, what did I read last? Um, Prometheus Rising, maybe? I don't remember, but whatever I read last, I wanted to break from the, that kind of fiction, so I started to read, um, that, that kind of non-fiction, so I started to read more fiction stuff, and uh, I guess it's easy to criticize the novel because of how the genre of science fiction progressed from this point, because uh, especially with, when you think of the idea of time travel, and as the novel obviously gets into, it doesn't really get too much into the depth of the con of the paradoxes of time travel and the difficulties of time travel. And I'm sure other novels and other films and other um, TV shows have gone into better detail and uh, care more about the specifics of the time travel aspect. Uh, but despite the novel being called a time machine, um, it's not very um, com complex in its um, depiction of time travel. and it is mostly used as a narrative device to bring us into the throes of the story. So what we have, um, what do I think about the novel? So H.G. Wells, I guess when you, when you think of novels, when you think of when people write fiction, you it's, impo it's very difficult to separate what the author is trying to present and what they actually believe. Uh, so I'm going to try to remove myself from what H.G. Wells might have believed, but if we'll stick with the story, the time traveler in the film, in the film, in the novel, the sort of protagonist, or the person telling the story, is someone with very strong socialist leanings. So when he goes into the future, so the story of the novel is he goes into the future uh, on this machine, and then he, um, either in... England, I think, um, London, and then he goes into the future a couple of million years or something, a couple of thousand, like a couple hundred thousand years, and then he, and then he stops, and then he sees these creatures around him that he called it Eloi, 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 I don't know, E L O I. He sees them. And they're these weak, um, weak, weak, meek, uh, flimsy kind of small creatures, kind of going around, uh, that resembled humans but didn't seem to be human per se. They had their own language, and they spoke to each other, and they normally lived a very hedonistic lifestyle. They were mostly playing around, having sex, eating. They didn't have any problems, it seemed, and they didn't seem to own any property. They just all lived um, with each other. They didn't have any sex form. It didn't seem like they had any kind of technology, but somehow they were able to eat um, well. They had food around, but he wasn't. But the protagonist was never really sure how they got their food. But somehow, there was a system in which they were able to live, and none of them actually had to do anything uh, to struggle with that. And to some degree, it seems like people didn't really care about each other, but they just seemed to be living in the moment and, you know, all that stuff. 
uh, to some degree, he, so he, originally he thinks it's some kind of socialist utopia where everyone managed, maybe perhaps society has moved, progressed so much at a point that socialism, socialism prevailed and people were able to live along with each other free and happy and without violence and um, just carefree and um, with all that stuff. Uh, but he also started to realize that a lot of these creatures, despite their joy and their ebulence, they were kind of, for lack of a better word, they're kind of stupid. They didn't really think anymore. They didn't really have a need for it. They didn't write. They didn't have any. There's no intellectual functioning with them. They just kind of. They they just were, as opposed to they were not really thinking. They couldn't. Re- to, to the degree at which they would need to think, they didn't really. Be use, they didn't seem like they were using their brains in the same way that we normally do so uh, the idea was that perhaps it was such a socialist utopia that everyone was just so happy they never had to work for anything because therefore um, in line with Darwinism people evolved into this state of being in which uh, they didn't need to use their brain and, brains anymore and they just um, because there's no hierarchies they all just they didn't have to struggle anymore, so they're all kind of stupid and just fl- frolicking around. Um, so it's interesting because you'd think a socialist utopia to be one that is more positive, but he actually frames it in a very negative way. Then halfway through the novel, you come out and realize that it's actually not a socialist utopia. It is more of a capitalist dystopia, which we find out where it's, it's actually, instead of, it's not really that there's one class that it's not really it's not it wasn't um that everyone kind of ended up becoming the same social order and everyone just started becoming equal to each other so no one really were, none of them were important or whatever but what actually happened was this human race split into two and then there was the very um the you know, let's say call them like the more the the they're the LOE the really the, the kind of stupid ones but they are very happy and they're frolicking around and they're they don't really have the care in the world and then there um was the Morlocks the Morlocks were the ones who lived underground uh, and they actually did all the um, mechanical work but they lived underground they didn't live overground they were so lived overground for so long underground for so long that they were very sensitive to light they couldn't be an, uh, they couldn't go above ground while there was light outside and what actually happened was that apparently in the story of the, of the book was that uh, society actually became so um, split into the capitalist owner and the um craft the slave or some sorts and it kept moving in those two directions divergently to the point where there was a class of human beings they move kind of diverged biologically because of the like the so the social structures caused them to diverge bio- biologically so there was a class of people who didn't need to work so they were just stupid they turned stupid because they never had to use their brain because they, ne- they never had to struggle they never had to be cunning and be creative and then there were the ones below who didn't necessarily, they weren't necessarily smart, they were still stupid. Everyone was, everyone was stupid in this world, but they were a little bit smarter because they, to some degree, they had to work mechanically, had mechanical action, so they had some kind of inkling of cunningness and creativity, and they uh, was, were actually, not to spoil the book, if you have, want to read the book, um, uh, don't watch the rest of this video, but what, essentially what they do is they, they're feeding, um, they're actually working on mechanically, they make all the clothes, they make all the other things, and then they bring it up to the top to feed the um, rich, uh, not the rich ones, but to feed the, high, the other, the LOE up there, keep them happy and fit and fat so that they can eat them, so they turn them into food actually, so uh, that is the um, twist of the novel of sorts, the real, that realization and all of this stuff. So the Time Machine by H.G. Wealth is very interesting because you have that kind of idea where um, less about the actual plot of the novel, the plot of the characters, less about any of that, but just more in the sense of what it was trying to present. These people in the late 1800s, or at least H.G. Wells, seem to be engaging very much with the idea and the difficulty of thinking about how the world will progress from the future. There was this idea that we will probably move, so in the socialist utopia, or, or um, capitalist dystopia and what he kind of argues that it seems to be some some mix of both and both are both bad um people have progressed negatively either way um if everyone is equal people become stupid because never no one has to ever struggle and then 
if we move divergently with um, the capitalist mindset, um, the slave re will eventually rebel against the these masters and uh, in a way that will subjugate the masters and turn the masters into food <laughs> to the extent of the novel. But he has a very pessimistic view of the world going forward at a time in which there's a lot of um, developments in science and technology and all this stuff. Um, sorry for that weird sound. <clears throat> Uh, but yeah, anyway, so it's it's very interesting. Uh, it was ri written in 1895. If you go fast forward 120 years where we are right now, you have a society in which the class divides seem to have become worse in terms of just um, relative, um, relative wealth. The, it seems to have got the divide between within countries seem to have increased, but overall everyone everyone seems to have gotten more affluent or more rich uh, and live longer and all this stuff because of increases in health, um, um, research and science and all this stuff. Uh, it's only a hundred years, but it you know, it seems like a whole lifetime ago. It seems like so much longer when you think of how much of a different world it was when he was writing this novel and when it, when where it is right now. So, yeah, um, it's a very interesting novel, The Time Machine, H.G. Wells. Uh, I would recommend it. It's very short. I, I kind of read very slowly and spread it out over three days, but, you know, uh, you could read it in, in one sitting. So, yeah, I, it's a H.G. Wells. Uh, very, um, also, science fiction, this is one of the first science fiction novels in a way that science fiction was established as a genre because H.G. Wells was one of the first science fiction writers, although there was some there were some writings earlier in the 1800s that had some science fiction elements in it. H.G. Wells was, was, was one of the biggest um, ones that really popularized the genre and influenced millions, um, I mean, millions of other, you know, stories. So, yeah, you should definitely read it, just even for the sake of just um, it's trying to see where it all started, this whole um, science fiction genre thing. So, yeah.